Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Stuart Hatfield, as has been said, and I'm a, I'm a member of the NASA Ames uh, Quantum Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, uh, just about 20 minutes up the 101 at uh, Moffett Field, California. So we're local. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, some of our investigations and work and insights into uh, quantum heuristics, both for NIST devices and beyond. And as a, as a concrete application, um, I'm going to try and tie this to some uh, of our interests and in some uh, interesting problems in, in aerospace and network design. And I'll just mention, I've, this work spans a, a lot of the group's work, so I've, I've listed most of our group, but I want to highlight the first name at the bottom, uh, Zoe Gonzalez, who was our summer intern, and, and it's her project on uh, project led on network design I'll be, I'll be highlighting in particular. Uh, so firstly, I'll, firstly, I want to give some, say, general remarks on NASA's interest in quantum computing. Um, I mean, clearly, it doesn't take much imagination. NASA has a whole host of uh, computational problems, communication challenges, all sorts of things. And so NASA traditionally has, you know, for this reason, has always been very interested uh, in cutting edge computational technologies. I know as an example, at NASA Ames, just up the road, we host Pleiades, uh, which, is, which is one of the world's fastest uh, supercomputers. Of course, this depends on the benchmark. Um, you know, one can imagine from, you know, uh, communicating between rovers on, on the moon to uh, general space missions, plannings, scheduling to, to aeronautic challenges of, of tomorrow. Uh, these, these computational problems are ubiquitous. Uh, a, a particularly interesting example that I want to kind of touch on throughout this talk is um, future deployments of large-scale unmanned drone networks, you know, more generally unmanned aerial systems. And I want to highlight there's, there's really a lot of very tantalizing civilian applications for these things, right, from emergency services, rescue to, you know, you can imagine deploying these on Mars to map the, the terrain, right? Um, and so we're, we're very interested in uh, using kind of these problems that actually come from applications faced by other, say, groups, researchers, engineers at NASA, you know, the real-world problems they face, uh, to try and you know, extract well, what can we do for, for these problems with quantum computers and what kind of ad advantage can we potentially offer now or in the future. Uh, so just wanted to briefly uh, touch on some of our interests at Quail. Um, what's nice is that we have the, the, the freedom and scientific interest to, to think about, you know, again, applications strongly tied to NASA, as I mentioned, um, you know, which relate really to fundamental, say, scientific problems uh, in, in things you've heard about this conference, like optimization in, in simulating physical systems, machine learning, and so on. Uh, but then we really do try to tie our research interests all the way down to, to bottom level physical insights, right? How can we uh, gain insight from fundamental physics to, to, you know, to design better algorithms for, for existing hardware, but also inform the design of, of better hardware going forward? Um, and, you know, this list is here. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but in the top right, there's a very nice uh, perspective article from this year, if you're interested, freely, variable, freely available in the archive, which, uh, which overviews quite a lot of our, our recent research. Uh, so for, the, for aerospace applications, um, what I wanna, the picture I want to give in mind today is, is communication challenges. And so at NASA, really, our three main challenges in, in the aer aerospace communication sector are availability, integrity and, and confidentiality. And so some of the thrusts we've been looking at, um, at the bottom, unfortunately, I'm not going to go into detail about this today, but there's some very nice work out of uh, the NASA Glenn folks in Ohio actually starting to look at uh, deploying QKD protocols uh, and actually building hardware demos and such um, for enhancing NASA security in the future. Uh, that topic will probably have to, say, to wait till Q2B 2020 next year. Um, but today I want to talk about, you know, as a thing to talk in the session, about optimization problems. So I'm going to get to shortly a, a case study in uh, optimization problems meant to model, say, robust network design problems, um, which are, of course, closely related to many problems for, for resource allocation, scheduling, planning, this sort of thing. Uh, so if, before we get to our application, I, I'd like to say some general remarks about optimization, right? That's the, the theme of the session. Um, so optimization is, is well known in computer science, you know, suffers or benefits, as you might say, from the problem that, that many problems are fundamentally hard. You know, great computer scientists have been cracking their heads for decades, and we still have many just fundamental open questions in the field, and for many problems, you know, just the best alg algorithm is what it is, and maybe next year it might be a different algorithm, right? But I say benefit because, you know, if we didn't have these hard computational challenges, 
none of us would be here in the sense that we wouldn't need the potential of quantum computers to try, try and tackle and push forward what we can solve. Um, I want to mention all, uh, also that we, you know, we typically hear a lot of talk, at least in the, in the media and such, about things like satisfiability and kind of P and MP and, and decision problems. One thing I want to emphasize, though, without going too much detail, is once we start using these machines for, as approximate solvers, it really gives much more potential dimensions for quantum advantage, right? Because now we have other things. So it, for a decision problem or an exact optimization problem, it's really you solve it or you don't, right? And if the quantum computer gets almost all the way there, you know, that's really not reflected. But with approximate optimization, we, we have not only, say, runtime, like how many resources are needed to, to run the algorithm, um, but what's the quality of the solution? And is, is the quality on the average, or in the worst case, does that you know, give you a better approximation um, to your problem at hand? And indeed, so there's a very rich theory of, of complexity for approximate problems, which I'm not going to talk about. But I want to emphasize that in practice, a lot of algorithms that are employed are, are heuristics. And so what's a heuristic? I just want to define it informally. It's basically an algorithm without bounds. And so these could be. Uh, performance bounds, i.e. I don't know, say, how well it does over the worst case. Uh, this can even mean, in some cases, runtime bounds. You know, we have instances of very successful algorithms classically that I can't provably even show will terminate in all cases, right? Nevertheless, though, the key thing about these heuristics is that they're typically developed through a kind of uh, run and see procedure, i.e., you know, make some modifications, run that on a batch of problems, test, refine. You know, this was kind of the scientific uh, learning before there was machine learning. You know, many of these things were done by hand in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, but we've, through you know, this kind of trial and error and, and refined development, we've ended up with a lot of very strong heuristics for good problems, it, again, without these provable guarantees. And so this is witnessed by every year. You, know, you, can, you can Google it right now. There's, there's very competitive competitions for what's the best SAT solver this year, or what's the best machine learning classifier for a particular problem, and so on. Right? And so it really is an arms race, so to speak as into how, what's the best heuristic this year versus the next year. Um, so we're very excited about the potential of heuristics and approximate optimization as a new avenue to, to really put current and future quantum technology to use. Um, so far, you know, we have, we have D-wave quantum annealers, we have small-scale circuit model machines available online and through certain hardware vendors. But really, I want to emphasize, testing so far has been extremely limited. I mean, the jury is still out into how to best use these machines for optimization and how much we can really squeeze out of them for important applications of interest. So I'd like to just state, we, we conjecture in our group that, that quantum heuristics for optimization, especially over the next couple of years, um, you know, as, as 50 and 100 and so, so on qubit machines become available, really have a potential to significantly broaden the applications of quantum computing. Um, so I just want to quickly mention that we've, you know, we've seen some great talks by hardware vendors, lots of excitement. Um, but there's a nice anecdote, which is that in the 70s, Hans Mark, who was the director of Ames, brought one of the leading uh, supercomputers to Ames, which at the time, which was one of these first kind of massively parallel machines. And the previous to this, pretty much everything was sequential. This was kind of a whole new model of classical computation. And what happened? People said, oh, that'll never work. There's no way you can you know, get these things to talk together. Stick to the wind tunnels, said a lot of the engineers. Well, 30 or 40 years later, if you go to NASA Ames now, you'll see the majority of the wind tunnels are shut down, decrepit, and the supercomputer is, is humming, right? So it's very clear who won this race. I just want to keep this in mind that there may be bumps along the way, but the, the, the long-term impact of, of these new technology programs really is, is worth it. And so we saw, I believe, a great talk by John Martinez about uh, quantum supremacy. So I don't, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but I want to highlight that uh, NASA uh, did, did collaborate and was involved in this great result. In particular, I want to highlight um, QFlex, developed by uh, some of our group, uh, which is a state-of-the-art uh, classical high-performance computing simulator for simulating quantum circuits. This is one of the simulators used uh, for the classical benchmarking of this result, I believe uh, John discussed. Um, and then I also believe uh, John Prescott, I missed these talks, unfortunately, you know, talked a bit about what next beyond quantum supremacy. Well, to tie this all in together, what I want to emphasize is that you know, now that we have really these devices that can do something beyond sort of our classical ability to simulate, you know, wh what should I do with this thing? I don't necessarily have a useful algorithm in the pocket. Well, I would propose the best thing to do is to use these devices to help design the next algorithm, or help design the algorithm we should run on the machines two years, five years, 
10 years out, right? And the way to do that is through more systematic, larger scale uh, empirical testing of, of current algorithms, of various issues like parameter setting, and, and more so of, of new paradigms beyond existing ones like QAA and kneeling and, and things you've heard about. So indeed, so NASA's had a, um, a D-Wave quantum annealing device at NASA Ames in several iterations for about five, six, seven years or so. Um, and you know, we've, we've been able to produce a lot of interesting science with these devices. However, you know, the actual power and the potential advantage of, of these devices and beyond for optimization problems still remains unclear. Um, I mean, one, one of the fundamental issues, which I'll talk about a bit later, is that uh, due to hardware limitations with current annealers, we can only typically embed uh, simple problems or kind of very small problems due to embedding overhead. Um, but we're very excited that uh, some brand new features available on these annealers uh, should help alleviate some of these things. Not only just the bigger machines with, you know, with, you know better, say, noise characteristics, more connectivity, um, but also some... Uh, some new features that have been kind of implemented through feedback from the community, like reverse annealing and, and pausing features. And I'll, I'll give an example to make this clear what I mean a bit later. Um, but even more exciting is, of course, these new gate model algorithms. And, and why do I say more exciting? Well, because we're not on these devices in principle, at least. We're not restricted to one algorithm. You know, it's not just an annealing and I have, you know, some kind of schedule flexibility. It's I have, in principle, at least, much more flexibility designed to run, you know, any algorithm in principle of the vast literature or new algorithms tomorrow we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, so fortunately, uh, we believe many of the lessons we've learned, though, from you know, testing and, and using, say, existing hardware will transfer over to, to future devices. Uh, and so we're very excited to now start running some new heuristics beyond what we can classically simulate and, and see what happens and then uh, hopefully influence better heuristics for tomorrow. So I just want to quick, quickly uh, mention some of the connections between these. So these are three of the kind of most commonly known NISC, let's say, era heuristics. This is not exhaustive. I just want to mention some of the connections. Um, so adiabatic and quantum annealing are, are well known. They've definitely been mentioned a couple times. Uh, depending on who you talk to, D-Wave runs some variant or abstraction of these algorithms. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but I, I, you know, as a rough approximation, one can think of quantum annealing as sort of the finite temperature version of adiabatic quantum optimization, where quantum a AQO is, is assumed zero temperature in the ideal model. And these, in these, uh, these algorithms are nice because they have two main ingredients. One's a Hamiltonian that just represents your cost Hamiltonian, a cost function, sorry, so if I can, say, minimize that Hamiltonian, I can minimize the, the function at hand in your problem. Um, and then QA is a bit different because instead of, say, driving under both these Hamiltonians at the same time, you know, with a varying schedule, we're now going to do a bang-bang approach. So I'm going to hit it with the cost Hamiltonian, then the mixing Hamiltonian, cost Hamiltonian, mixing Hamiltonian, and so on. And the, one of the advantages being that as my, say, hardware grows, I can fit in, you know, more, more depth uh, of these iterations, a, a longer depth circuit, and potentially get better performance. Um, and so for the, for the annealing case, uh, we want to we run and get the best solution possible. For, for QAOA, uh, similarly, we want to run and get the best solution possible. And, and so both protocols can be used sort of in exact optimization mode or, or approximate optimization mode. Um, again, we have a same perspective article at the bottom. So that's the previous one. There's a nice overview of our uh, annealing work in our group over the last five or so years. But so we've done a lot of annealing work. I'm not going to touch on it. I just want to touch on one more recent result, um, which is the power of pausing. So, one of, so the, one of the new features implemented on these annealing uh, devices that literally came from feedback from researchers in our group, from other researchers in the community, say, hey, if you could maybe add this feature you know, to D-Wave, we might get better performance. Uh, and what was nice was that over you know, several iterations over years, they actually implemented some of these features. So the main idea is that on the bottom left, um, you have an you know, approximation of a normal annealing schedule. If you don't quite follow what that means, it's okay. The basic idea is that you know, as, you, as time pr progresses in the anneal, you're going to start off with mostly uh, mixing Hamiltonian and driving Hamiltonian. That's going to go down, and the cost Hamiltonian is going to ramp up. The, the annealing idea, or the, the adiabatic idea, I should say, is that if you go slow enough, you'll, you'll stay in the ground state. Ergo, you'll solve your 
optimization problem. Well, you know, these things are great in theory, but you know, clearly, the, clearly the D-Wave does not solve problems with 100% accuracy or probability. Clearly, um, there's, some, there's some more physics happening. And so one of the, the insights made was that if you anneal through the, the minimum gap, which is, which is a technical point in the anneal, um, at, an, at a, say, finite speed, what's typically going to happen is you're going to have some diabatic transitions uh, to, say, some, some low-lying but not ground state energy levels, right? And so what was proposed was that if you go through the minimum gap and then you pause the anneal, just pause everything, then maybe, or potentially thermalization can help you. And so, so interactions, say, unintended interactions with the environment, this sort of thing, can cause you to sort of repopulate these, these, this low-lying ground state level, which is exactly what you want. And so a very nice result led by uh, Jeff Marshall from our group uh, showed a very nice match with sort of this theory and, and some, some native D-Wave problems. So this plot in the middle, um, the, 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 the point here is that if you put your pause at, the, at just kind of at the right location, which is not, you know, doesn't, it's not a tiny location, has a lot of wiggle room, but if you put it in the right location, where the yellow is, you see a, a several orders of magnitude jump in probability increase, right? And so this was, this was very exciting for us uh, when this result came out. Um, and the, the question, though, was, so for this, this problem used kind of a native uh, prob problem. By native, I mean it was kind of fits right on the Chimera graph, which is the native D-Wave architecture graph. And so, of course, we asked, well, what happens with application problems? I mean, do you still get this kind of great effect still, uh, or, or does this wash away? So this, this is one of the motivating questions for, for the work I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, but before do we do that, I just want to return to, to aerospace. So we have all these machines coming along. What, what we really like to report to NASA bosses in an ideal world is, is what we can run, what the cost will be, how much advantage we'll get, which platform to choose, and, and so on and so forth. Right? And, but this, this, is, this is hard to do. Number one, we can embed and run you know, different problem types, let's say, on, on different platforms. It's very hard to get an apples to apples comparison at this stage. Um, so, we, so working with some collaborators at, Name, at Ames, we came up, um, we were given, let's say, scenarios like this, where you have, again, distributed networks of unmanned aerial systems. Uh, you can imagine these things are moving very fast. You can imagine they're moving through some comp you know, complicated mountainous or city environment. You can imagine uh, communications constantly getting disrupted, right? So one goes behind a, a mountain or a tree and it loses line of sight, this sort of thing. More of a, these, these uh, say, line of sights and, and, and really fun fundamentally the, the network uh, underlying the or graph structure, let's say, is constantly changing, right? Now, we'd love to implement these sort of kind of uh, complicated uh, dynamic problems, but in terms of resources, the, the simplest thing to do is kind of abstract away, you know, simplified versions of these problems that we can run and then slowly, as re more resources become available, ramp up complexity to something more closer to the ap actual application of interest, right? So if you, if you stare at this, you know, it shouldn't be too hard to see. Well, okay, well, if I take a time slice, you know, say a small five-second window or something, I can kind of extrapolate graph problems. And so that's what we're going to do, is we're going to derive a, a graph problem from these types of scenarios. Uh, and, then, and then try to solve it on, on D-Wave and then ideally some future quantum gate model devices. But so I'm going to show a video now. So, so what this video is of, this is of uh, actually a very nice aeronautic future systems demo. I'll, I'll emphasize this, this demo was not built to, extract, to get a graph problem. It was actually a case that there's some very nice testing, you know, different communication sensors, channels, this sort of thing happening at NASA concurrently. And we realized that this was a perfect setup to actually extract some, say, closer to realistic graphs for our problems. So what's, what's commonly done in the literature is the scientist says, I like this class of toy problems. Let's do some random graphs or let's pick my favorite one. What we want to do is rather than just, you know, give kind of an ad hoc toy problem, find sort of a toy problem inspired from challenges and, and work already being done at NASA that then going forward, we can hopefully tie in uh, more and more advancements as the technology matures. So I, th I think that played, but what was, what was happening there is we have, uh, th oops, three drones, sorry, three drones in a, what was built is this is actually a scale model of Corpus Christi, Texas. And then to mimic things like interference, there's some electromagnetic uh, disruptors that, that block channels at communication at a certain point, right? And then taking several snapshots 
uh, of, of this setup ga you know, gave us some simple graphs that we could then run our, our problem on, I'll, I'll next describe. But so again, so we started off with this, with this complicated communication system. You know, you can imagine there's different channels, you know, maybe a high power, low power communication network for, for every link. You can imagine there's different costs, space, time, economic, and so on. We want to, to, to kind of uh, boil this down to a, to a weighted graph problem. So we assume we're given a, given a graph, which again corresponds to one of these uh, vehicle scenarios. And we want to find a spanning tree. And so the idea here is this kind of, a, this kind of captures the idea of a robust network. Now, down the road, we, you know, we want, might want a more complicated object, such as you know, something that has two connections between every pair, this sort of thing. But this is a good first approximation. And I want to emphasize that you know, nobody's raised their hand. This, this a priori, as I've stated, is an easy problem. I mean, we have great classical algorithms. The catch, though, is if I you know, make a realistic assumption, like every drone, you know, for example, can't just talk to infinite others, so just say every, every node has a, has a bounded degree this corresponds to, then the problem becomes MP hard. And so now we're in an interesting area where there, there is more potential, say, for quantum advantage. Um, and so there's been many papers over the years about how to map these type of problems to D-Wave. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, the, the brass tacks is that we want, excuse me, what's called a cubo mapping. Um, the interesting thing, thing to emphasize, though, is that if you think about this spanning tree, what is it? As, as I showed in the graph, right? it's an it's a edge set that connects every, every node. But clearly, this is a non-local property in the sense that if I, if I zoom in on a node and you just give me an edge, I can't tell you know, if that connects to a tree way out in the graph or not. right? And so what this translates into is that to kind of get around this non-locality, we have to pay for it with, with uh, auxiliary variables, which translates into extra qubits. And the bottom line there is that to do this kind of, say, more complicated type of problem, it just ends up coming with more embedding overhead, um, which limits the size of the problem we can, we can actually embed and run. So this is another reason why we're excited for uh, you know, Pegasus and future annealing topologies that can potentially allow for even bigger, better problems to be embedded. So what was nice about th this paper is that we kind of got some of the results we wanted. Uh, this is still preliminary work. It should be in the archive before Christmas, but I can't promise you that. Um, but we were, so we were able to map these problems, and then we were able to run them on the D-Wave 2000Q at Ames and successfully solve them, which was kind of our first box. We were happy with that. But then um, maybe the perhaps most more scientifically interesting demonstration here was that we were able to show by using this annealing pause feature I described. Uh, and moreover, using something called, called partial gauge transforms, which is, a, which is a way, roughly speaking, of kind of, kind of uh, randomizing over kind of built-in errors in devices, we we're able to again demonstrate an order of magnitude or so improvement in the success probability. Um, so that was, that was a very nice result. This is the first case we know of where Pause has shown this for an embedded problem. Um, it's, it's worthwhile noting that, the, you know, as maybe expected, the, let's say the magnitude of improvement was a bit less pronounced than the, uh, not the unembedded native problem case, right? And so this is one of our uh, future directions to better understand this connection and kind of what level of improvement we can expect using, say, a pause in, in bigger, and bigger problems in future annealing devices. Uh, what's also nice is that we, did, we found a good uh, match with the theory predictions of the, of the previous paper. In particular, uh, again, the pause location was found to be, say, consistent across across instances and essentially predictable in advance, um, and some, some further more technical results about increasing uh, ferromagnetic couplings and so on for D-Wave was also found to, uh, to come through. So again, so we have some nice kind of toy demonstrations uh, for these type of problems that the D-Wave can solve it, that there is you know, some interesting potential for future devices. Uh, nevertheless, though, I just want to emphasize the limitations that restrict us to small problems, and this makes it very difficult to extrapolate about where the future lies in terms of will we get tremendous advantage from, for these type of problems or not. Uh, we're excited about the improved hardware. This should help you know, let us run bigger problems, gain more insight. Um, and I'll, I'll mention also, as I started off the, you know, phrasing this as a case study, we really are interested in comparing, say, a quantum gate model approach to the same problem. And so I'm not going to go into detail on this, but one of the immediate things is that you quickly realize the same type of uh, in 
mappings, embeddings don't work, right? So now it becomes even more of an apples to orange comparison where you have two very different problem representations on two very different hardware, likely running very different instances, um, and then trying to extrapolate performance scaling about these things. It's a, it's a very non-trivial task, but we're excited to make much more progress on it this coming year, especially as we gain access to some of these bigger and better gate model devices. So I only have a few minutes left, but I want to just touch briefly on some of our gate model works. I think everyone's heard QA a few dozen times in this conference, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. I just want to highlight some of our work, our recent work, which was um, we, we, just, we were tasked with, okay, how do we actually apply QAA to real-world problems, right? And in the original formalism by Farhi et al., there were some nice kind of simple, unconstrained problems, but what happens in real life? Well, problems have constraints, hard constraints that must be satisfied, and, and if one of those is broken, you don't, you don't care. It's not a solution anymore. Uh, you know, and these can come from the problem definition itself, the intrinsic to the problem, but they often also arrive, arise in practice, you know, from encoding the problem, from embedding the problem, this sort of thing, right? It's, it's very common. So in annealing, we have a whole nice story I'm not going into about using penalty terms, right? Which basically, any solution that's infeasible, it, it shifts its spectrum away from the, the logical states. It kind of gives you a kind of uh, natural way of, of sort of protecting against infeasible states. However, we quickly realized that this same approach um, is not necessarily appropriate for QAOA. The reason being, if you, you know, if you put penalty terms Unless you have, let's say, near infinite penalty, which is not practical at all, you're very quickly going to have probability essentially leak out of your feasible subspace you started in, of, of feasible solutions, very quickly leak out into the infeasible states. And then once it's out there, it's, it's very hard, and, and say, without some kind of active error correction, to get that to come back in. So what we realized was that, you know, based on some similar ideas originally inspired by annealing, you know, rather than trying to do penalties or some kind of sophisticated error correction thing, why don't we just change the algorithm, generalize it, change the, the mixer driver term such that it forces you to stay in the feasible subspace to begin with, right? Then, you know, modulo errors, you don't have this issue of potentially jumping to infeasible states. Uh, it's half the work's done for you already. Um, so in our, in our paper, which the, the details are on the top there, um, we describe all this in detail. We even give uh, more precise design criteria about what these mixers need to do, and clearly preserve feasibility, as I said, but also they need to kind of have reachability. They need to be able to give you transitions between all states. Otherwise, you know, so they can't be, can't be too strong, can't be too weak. They need to be kind of just right. Uh, so in, in the paper, again, there's, there's the details there. Uh, the, the kind of main difference with the original QA, if I give you one takeaway, is the, the original QA, uh, each of the, let's say, QA stages is a time evolution under a fixed Hamiltonian. We instead, um, we replace that with much more general families of single parameterized unitary operators. Uh, these are not equivalent to the original QA. I can talk in detail if you'd like, but uh, they are much more general. But more importantly, we give explicit mappings for a whole variety of problems from uh, max independent set and vertex cover to traveling salesperson to single machine scheduling. Uh, we think these are all you know, steps much closer to actual important application problems of, of interest. Uh, and, and moreover, our onsets really naturally encompasses, let's say, hardware-based approaches uh, from, the, from the bottom up. Um, and so just to mention quickly a problem, which is, again, even a much simpler abstraction of, say, a scheduling or planning problem is, is graph coloring. So graph coloring is a classic MP-hard decision problem. But when you go to optimization problem, this, say, single decision problem relates to actually a whole, whole host of different challenging optimization problems. Um, and these, these problems are, you know, what you might imagine, you know, very good surrogates for, say, scheduling or planning applications. Um, and so one of the things we propose in our paper is, you know, to use what's called a one-hot encoding, as you see the, in the top right there. Um, so where we, you know, pay a bit more qubits in that instead of using, say, log k qubits for vertex to encode the k colors, we now use k. But the advantage of that is it greatly simplifies all the other operators needed to do a QA away. Um, and so in this case, I don't go into the details, but we, we propose the XY mixer. Uh, and I'll, if anyone saw Chad Rigetti's talk yesterday, I believe he talked about iSwap, um, Google has similar gates also. So I emphasize that these new gates, these hardware people are exploring, are, are very closely related to, to these sort of interactions. And so they're very promising for, as I believe Chad mentioned, reducing the gate depth uh, and squeezing more out of your, your near-term devices. 
Uh, I'm running out of time, so I just want to quickly mention that uh, we, we do have some recent results showing the XY mixer is better than the penalty approach for small examples. And some very, very recent results from our, our student, Michael, um, looking at noise has showed that in terms of just noise resilience, you know, while this noise is obviously a problem, always a problem, the XY mixer does have advantages in terms of scaling over, uh, say, the normal mixer and, and penalty approach. Uh, future work, we want to push case studies um, for aerospace and other applications. Ideally, we would like stronger apples-to-apples -apples type equations. Uh, we're still very interested in the, in the potential advantages of NISC, uh, better understanding of current algorithms and technologies, and especially beyond you know, current annealers and current paradigms like QAOA. Uh, and then finally, just to emphasize, we're at the early stage of quantum computing. Everything's still open. This is a very exciting time. We really need to work together as a community to put things forward. And finally, there's a whole host of optimization applications beyond NISC I haven't mentioned. Fortunately, we have Ashley Montanaro next, hopefully, to uh, fill you in on some fault-tolerant quantum computing applications. But uh, I'm out of time. So thanks a lot. Let's learn. Lastly, web page internships. We're always looking. I started as an intern. Please send us your students. And we have a very great NISC newsletter just launched available there. Thank you very much. Question? Well, I have one. How hard is it to figure out when to pause and how long to pause? Uh, yeah, so my understanding is um, it needs to be after the minimum gap. Obviously, finding where the minimum gap is is a hard problem, but right. my understanding is that, say, within like a 1% or 5% or something in the gap, meaning that there is quite a bit of flexibility. And often the, the pause can be longer than the anneal itself, which sort of gives you even more wiggle room. Uh, I, I, my understanding is that it, they were surprised at how robust it was to location, but that wasn't the difficulty. It doesn't have to be... No, yeah, which, which would have made it useless potentially, right? But thank you.